Due to the themes of this podcast, listener discretion is advised. Lock your doors. Close the blinds. Change your passwords. This is Secrets and Spies. Secrets and Spies is a podcast that dives into the world of espionage, terrorism, geopolitics, and intrigue. This episode is presented by Matt Fulton and produced by Chris Carr. On today's episode, I'll be speaking with Philip Smythe. Philip was a SARA fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy from 2018 to 2021, and has researched Shia Islamist militarism at the University of Maryland. For over a decade, he's been one of the leading researchers on Iranian-backed terrorist organizations, such as Hamas, Lebanese Hezbollah and other affiliated groups throughout Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Persian Gulf. Philip returns to the show to discuss a spate of attacks by Iranian-backed militia groups against U.S. forces in Syria, Iraq, and the Red Sea. He'll tell us who these groups are, what their strategy is behind these attacks, and if he believes there's a potential for the violence to escalate further. A couple house cleaning notes before we get started. I want to thank all of our listeners who are currently supporting us on Patreon. If you're not currently supporting the show on Patreon, please consider doing so. It's super easy. Just go to patreon.com forward slash secrets and spies. Depending on the subscription level you choose, you'll receive a set of secrets and spies coasters or a coffee cup. By subscribing, you'll be directly supporting this podcast and thus we shall remain forever in your debt. Your generosity helps keep this podcast going. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get going. The opinions expressed by guests on Secrets and Spies do not necessarily represent those of the producers and sponsors of this podcast. Welcome back to the show. It's good to have you. Well, thanks for having me again. I don't know why you would. There's no one better to speak to about this kind of stuff than than you. So... Anytime, anytime we can get you on to kind of make sense of this stuff. It's very, it's very cool. I live by Blazing Saddles logic. Mongo only pawn in game of life. <laughs> you know, um, my mom's a big fan of yours. Uh oh. My what do I do? I need to do something special now? No, 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 no. I'm saying like she so so she <laughs> was she was saying to me earlier after after before our 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 last episode, she was sort of saying, like, I can never keep track of who's who and why they're all fighting each other. And then she listened to your episode twice. Okay, so you know, all I'm going to take from this is I like your mother more because she was not only tracking, but didn't kind of just shut off after I started to get a little bit more, you know, long winded and just keep rattling yeah. off. So I, again, I may have some some pumpkin pie left over um, and she is more than welcome to have some if she'd like. <laughs> I will. I will. I will let her know about that. I'm sure she'll appreciate it. Um, but, yeah, no, I think she uh, that can confusion there probably speaks for um a lot of people so we can we can work on that a bit more today okay before before we get started tell tell listeners who may have missed the last episode or or something um tell tell listeners about yourself and and what you do well um i'm philip Smythe. um i've worked in the field of kind of focusing on uh iran and iran's proxy groups these are the groups that it uses to essentially extend its influence uh, across the middle east and actually globally as well um and a lot of these proxy groups tend to fit very specific models that the Iranians have built. And now we're, we're hearing a lot about them kind of, oh, well, this group is an Iranian proxy and it's doing X in Gaza or it's doing Y in Lebanon. Um, and so I tend to track those organizations, um, became a bit obsessive with them, particularly around uh, the war in Syria. Um, in 2013, I was tracking when they were recruiting uh, and also putting people into uh, Syria to fight. Um, and so I have just kind of maintained this this running uh, track record on uh, a lot of uh, different and I would say uh, somewhat esoteric uh, groups that the Iranians utilize uh, to you know, do their thing in the Middle East. Thanks for that. So uh, last time you were on, a little over a month ago, we sort of focused on your coverage of the October 7th attacks and sort of really talked about um, Hamas and uh, Hezbollah, who they are, what they want, and sort of how Iran manages this web of proxy forces spread across the region. Um, Today, I'd like to pull back from Gaza a bit and talk about the spate of of, uh, attacks by some other of these militia groups, probably not as well known as Hamas Mm -hmm. um, and Hezbollah, 
against U.S. forces and sort of dive into that a bit about who these guys are and what they're doing and, you know, how you see this potentially going in the future. Just to get us started, I'll go through a rundown of the attacks that have sort of happened over the last month and a half or so, our responses to it, and then I'll come to you to sort of start digging in. Sound good? Yeah, that works. All right. So on October 18th, militias launched a drone strike on U.S. forces at Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq. The strike was intercepted. Uh, the next day, a false alarm at the base caused the death of a civilian contractor from cardiac arrest. Meanwhile, a drone strike on the Altanif garrison in eastern Syria, that's housing several hundred Green Berets and other special operations forces, resulted in over 20 injuries. On the 19th, the USS Kearney and the Red Sea intercepted four cruise missiles and 15 drones over a nine-hour period launched from Yemen by Ansar Allah, or more commonly known as the Houthi movement. Uh, Saudi Arabia also shot down a cruise missile fired toward Israel. On the 20th, the State Department ordered all non-emergency personnel to evacuate the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad and the consulate in Erbil. On the 24th, Iraqi militias claimed responsibility for multiple attacks on U.S. forces in eastern Syria. On the 27th, the Pentagon responded and launched airstrikes against weapons depots and other sites linked to the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and affiliated militias. I think it was 12 sites in Iraq and four in Syria that were struck. On November 8th, a U.S. Reaper drone was shot down in international airspace near Yemen, and U.S. airstrikes hit Iranian targets in Deir Azur, eastern Syria. The following day on the 9th, U.S. forces in Iraq were attacked three times in 24 hours, including further drone strikes against al-Assad and al-Harir air bases and an IED attack against a patrol near the Mosul Dam. Additionally, Israel's Arrow 3 missile defense system intercepted a Houthi cruise missile over the Red Sea. On November 12th, additional airstrikes targeted a safe house and a training camp used by militias in Syria at Mayadeen and Abu Kamal. On the 20th, eight U.S. and coalition soldiers were injured in another missile attack against al-Assad Air Base. The next day, in retaliation, a U.S. AC-130 gunship destroyed a Qatayib Hezbollah vehicle in Iraq near Abu Ghraib. And lastly, on November 27th, so just this morning, a uh, gunman believed to be Houthis boarded a tanker in the Red Sea owned by an Israeli businessman. This follows the Houthis' seizure on the 19th of a cargo ship, the Galaxy Leader, also owned by an Israeli businessman. The USS Mason responded to the tanker's distress call. And the gunman fled. Hours later, two missiles were fired from Yemen toward the Mason's general vicinity. They missed and fell into the sea. So in all, this leaves us with 25 Iranian-linked militiamen killed, 68 U.S. service members wounded, all believed to be concussions, I believe, um, and one civilian contractor dead from a cardiac incident. Um, so, Philip, um, can you tell us a bit about who these groups are um, and sort of what their what their strategy is here? Why, why are they doing this? All right. So let, let's boil this down because we're dealing with sub-regions within the Middle East. And yeah. we're also dealing with a variety of different entities that are actually pulling this stuff off. Um, and I'll actually, I'll try to end with the Houthis uh, because I okay. think they have a kind of an interesting piece here. Um, and the Iraqis, uh, I've been kind of even more hyper-focused on the Iraqis just based on uh, what I've studied for a while. So I can give you some other detail on that as well. Um, so a lot of the attacks uh, in Iraq, you're going to be noticing this and you see it, uh, they've, they put up their propaganda and everything else, but they'll often operate. And again, they have a number of different front group names. And just so everybody here knows, um, when I say a front group, uh, imagine there is an established organization and the established organization will often operate under a front group moniker. Uh, so let's say I am, I don't know, the Philip group, uh, and I'm going to claim an attack under, you know, the Diet Coke battalions, you know, so, something like Jay that. Jay Shaw Phillips, my, th there you go. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, I prefer Katai, but that's just me. Um, sure. it's a smaller, smaller, more elite group. Um, <laughs> but what we're, what we're actually getting here is since I'm going to take you back a couple of years, um, when, Qasem Soleimani, who is the head of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Quds Force, um, his aide, he was an IRGC aide, um, and also he was the quote-unquote second in command of the popular mobilization forces, Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, uh, that was his nom de guerre, um, Jafar al-Ibrahimi, that was his real name. Um, they were killed on January 3rd, 2020, by a U.S. missile strike, in addition to a lot of other Iraqi Shia militia uh, you know, junior and uh, mid-level commanders. Um, and after that happened, uh, the uh, Iranian-backed groups kind of predicated a certain response. You know, how are we going to 
you know, poke the bear, if you will, without poking a, an even bigger response after having such a huge loss to our network. Uh, it's important to remember that uh, Abu Mahdi al-Mohandis was a really big coordinator for the Iraqi Shia militias, and Qasem Soleimani pretty much you know, ran it as his own little kind of sub thing, his own little sub operation, uh, had a lot of focus on them. I mean, he had been taking thousands of these guys and putting them into Syria for how long? Uh, and in addition to that, also deploying them and building up these groups uh, for actions in Iraq. Um, and so one of the decisions that the Iranians and then these Ar Iraqi Shia militias that they uh, control uh, came up with was, OK, we can launch attacks against the U.S. I, I mean, it's what I like to call implausible, plausible deniability. So they will mm -hmm. use monikers with these groups that you're kind of like, if you, you know the game and you're like, yeah, no, these are just Iranian back groups and this is how they operate. Um, but then you might also get, you know, a policymaker saying, yeah, but we don't know. We, we don't know because it's a different name and a different group. Okay, well, the weapon systems they use are normally used by Iranian-backed groups. You know, the the people who may have been killed while setting up one of these things, we know that they're attached to X, Y, or Z group. Um, and so part of that plan was, okay, we will establish these front groups, and then we are going to utilize them against American targets, not just American targets, sometimes Kurdish targets, sometimes other Iraqi targets, uh, Iraqi Arab targets, uh, even, you know, Civilian, I say civilian targets, I mean sometimes front groups were established uh, to put pressure on different, uh, you know, uh, civilian kind of protest organizations, you name it. They would put out statements and threats and stuff like that. And what materialized from that was a pretty you know, wide, I don't even want to call it a network because a lot of this, you know, the Iraqis will call these telegram militias because on the, um, I don't want to call it a social media site because it's really not, um, but on, on the telegram app all of a sudden a group would kind of materialize and then it would kind of get spread around in certain ways. And you're like, oh, well, this is, right. this is a new group. They have a statement of responsibility. They have a statement of intent for what they want to do to the Americans. So imagine so almost 40, over well over 40 of these groups had been established by you know, 2021, 2022. They'd launched a number of attacks against Americans uh, and American forces in Iraq. Um, so that was kind of an ongoing process. Um, and we, what we have now is it's another outgrowth of that, uh, where it's the, okay, well, we're just going to grow another bunch of front groups and we're going to have them attack U.S. targets. But if we take a step back here, it's kind of the question of, well, which groups are being utilized by the Iranians within Iraq to do these attacks? And uh, one of the major things is, I, I mean, I, I tend to look at a lot of these groups as who forms kind of the core networks for Iran, for the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC. Who are the most loyal? Who can they kind of get the most play from? Um, and of those, this time around, you have groups like Qatab Said al-Shuhada. You have a group like Qatab Hezbollah. Qatab Hezbollah is a very big player in this, hardcore loyalists to the Iranians. Uh, I mean, they're pretty much the guys who run the popular mobilization forces one way or another uh, through their leadership kind of being placed there. And then they kind of, you know, it trickles down to influence. Um, you have other kind of hardcore players like the Butter Organization. Butter Organization is one of the largest uh, uh, political players within Iraq. Uh, it was actually started by the IRGC out of, uh, this is like during the Iran-Iraq War, so back in the 1980s, early 1980s. Um, from, you know, some Iraqi prisoners that they had captured and also some ideological loyalists. Um, and so they kind of formed up this group. I'm not going to get into details on that. I could, I could go all day. Um, yeah. But you have an organization like that. You have another group uh, called Harakat Hezbollah al-Nujaba or Harakat al-Nujaba. Um, and actually, so it's funny, with Katab uh, Said al-Shuhada and uh, Harakat Hezbollah al-Nujaba, I actually wrote the first things in English that were publicly available on them. And it was actually by accident that I had kind of found them and kind of these, these formed kind of networks that were in there. They had logos, they had, you know, parades for their stuff, but no one was talking about it. And even in Iraqi media, and I would kind of reach out to those guys, but it's interesting why, you know, they're forming kind of this, this core network that we're actually able to see. Um, you'll notice that the United States, when we've hit back, we've hit back at Qatab Hezbollah primarily. Qatab Hezbollah yeah. being one of the largest factions that's actually doing this. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just going to be like rattling off a ton of militia names. Hey, that's 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 why I call you up. <laughs> Hopefully, we can boil this down. Just to just to just to just so we're clear with listeners here, this is a different group from Lebanese Hezbollah. Yeah, so totally different. 
Well, hold on. See, I always run, we run into this problem when we're reading a lot of the material written because is it a totally yeah. different group? Yes, it is a totally different group. It's a Rocky. However, ideologically, they speak the same language. They answer right. to the same guys. They're just as loyal as Lebanese Hezbollah. Lebanese Hezbollah being essentially the first among equals for yeah. the Iranian Golden proxy child. groups. Like that's their their you know crown and excuse me, they were a jewel in the crown. Um, Qatab Hezbollah has essentially functioned in that form in Iraq. But what the Iranians will do is they will, they love splintering different groups and kind of crafting, like, who's the most loyal? We're going to take that network out and use it here. We're going to do that here. A uh, good example of that is Harakat Hezbollah al Um, So here's the crazy thing. That group was actually formed out of another, what one could have considered uh, a rather loyal group to the Iranians within Iraq, which was called Asai Bath al Haq. And it actually has a name that kind of sounds like a, like a comic book movie, uh, what it translates out to. It's like the League of Righteousness. Um, so, I mean, that's a good way to remember it. And that's the Khazali's network, right? That was Qais al Khazali. Um, yeah. So, that was, that was his network. And he started it with a guy named Akram Kabi. Both of them came from. Uh, Sure, listeners might remember this name, Muqtada Sadr, the kind of scabrous um, uh, Iraqi cleric come politico, uh, who actually has a ton of power within uh, within kind of the Shia political realm within Iraq. Um, but they kind of, they were splintered from that network of Muqtada Sadr. Now, for a variety of different reasons, it's immaterial right now. But even then, let's say I've split, you know, I'm the Iranians and I splinter that group. Well, sometimes there's personal disagreements here or there. Sometimes they need to put pressure on even a loyal group because maybe they're getting their own ideas. Um, and around 2013, this group, Harakat Hezbollah al Nujabal, uh, emerged. And it was a massive recruiter for the war in Syria for Iraqi Shia militiamen. Um, the group itself was not really like you look at it and, you know, on paper, I'm sure there are some people who will say, oh, well, this is such a, you know, it must be a huge group because of all the people they recruited. No, nope. it's, it's rather small. Um, in, uh, uh, the popular mobilization forces, it's essentially their, their 12th brigade as they call it. That's, uh, that's in there. But these guys, you know, prove their loyalty in Syria. Akram Kabi, uh, who now essentially in, in a kind of very interesting way, acts almost as an open spokesman for these front groups, as if, you know, well, you know, and I'm representing this, this, this Islamic resistance in Iraq, you know, wink, wink. Um, but that doesn't always necessitate that he's really like his, his units are really doing the launching. Um, they've just kind of given him kind of the PR role to, to do a lot of that. Um, <clears throat> you then have a group like Qatab Saeed al-Shuada around the same time, 2012, 2013. This is a group that was taken from Qatab Hezbollah, you know, the most loyal of the loyal, um, and, you know, their leader, their leader now, Abu Allah, uh, he actually wasn't really even announced as their, their leader until a couple of years afterwards. Um, everybody thought it was another guy, uh, and myself included, because, you know, they had only put that stuff up. Um, but they're another kind of hardcore pro-IRGC, you know, type of group. Um, and so you see this, you see kind of this, this core network there, you know, you kind of think to yourself, well, were those groups created to put pressure on other Shia militias the Iranians control? Maybe. I mean, there's a chunk of that maybe there. Um, were they done because it's much easier to kind of keep this this uh, kind of cellular structure constantly dividing and, you know, another cell here, another cell here, and it's just replicating. I actually wrote about this in 2015. I called it cellular repl replication uh, with how That's they were an doing it. way to look at it. Yeah. It's, yeah. So, I mean, there, there's different mindsets to it. You know, maybe they have more control over these guys, so that means they'll follow the rules. Now, some evidence to that actually goes back to 2020, that, you know, maybe that's the deal, because Asai Bakht al -Hok, launched what was claimed, now again, we can have doubts over this, but it sounds pretty legit, that, uh, you know, Asai Bahl al you know, League of Righteousness, was launching their own kind of, they were not really accepted by the IRGC that they should be doing X, Y, and Z to the Americans. And, you know, there was some claims uh, in the media that Pesel Khazali um, was actually doing this because he wanted to get some election clout within kind of the the pro Islamic resistance crowd, you know, within uh, the Shia electorate. Um, so that did cause some some issues. So you kind of look at it and you're like, ah, okay, well, maybe there could be some issues here if a major strike mm -hmm. happens and one of the smaller groups wants to capitalize on that for for one reason or another. Um, but anyway, this time around. Um, a lot of those same groups are kind of the same core network that is populating a lot of these front groups that are out there. 
um, Qatab Hezbollah in particular. And you can see that from the airstrikes that occurred, a um, number of Qatab Hezbollah uh, people were killed in them. Uh, the airstrike that you're talking about that uh, was a, of a vehicle probably going out towards Abu Ghraib, uh, you know, was probably setting up to launch against Al Assad Air Base, which is where a lot of Americans are located. And an AC-130 uh, got that guy. Um, so, you know, you, you see stuff like this, you're kind of like, okay, so what you're telling me, Philip, is you have... One structure here, we don't know how legitimate it is. Another structure here, we don't know how legitimate it is, and that it kind of sort of answers to the Iranians. Um, well, they just to, to, to kind of square the circle, um, these groups do all answer to the Iranians. They will follow yeah. what is, is pretty easy to see, that the Iranians will say, okay, these are the weapon systems that we're going to be using. Here are the types of targets that we're going to be going after. Here is the variety of ways that we are going to kind of slow roll and unveil kind of different skill sets that we have. And this is the way that we're going to unveil certain weapon systems out there. Now, good example of this, uh, there is a group called Al-Muqawm al-Islamiya fil Iraq. Uh, you'll, you're going to hear me say the Islamic resistance in Iraq, the Islamic re resistance a lot. This is a moniker that pretty much every Shia militia uh, that the Iranians control utilize, but that doesn't yeah. mean that they don't just reprocess it into something else to confuse you. Um, so right now there is a new front group called the Islamic resistance in Iraq. This is just one of the front groups. This is the one that gets the most attention and they've done, you know, the most drone attacks and they've done a number of rocket attacks, stuff like that. Um, so you've seen that group kind of pop up and interestingly, they have kind of a almost open connection with Qatab Hezbollah an almost open connection with Harakat Hezbollah al Nujabah, but not, you know, just kind of. If you're, you're reading the tea leaves and you don't really need to read them all that carefully, you'll kind of see the parallels that are there. Oh, interesting. The group is praising uh, the martyrs of Qatab Hezbollah. Interesting. Akram Kabi with uh, Harakat Hezbollah al-Nujabah. He is coming out and he is uh, speaking for the groups and putting up their propaganda and essentially claiming that, you know, he had done that. Um, so you have groups like that that are uh, launching different attacks to put pressure on the Americans. Now, Let's get rid of all the kind of nuance and the little groups and the this and the that um, and focus on kind of big picture. So big picture on this, you know, why are they use, using all these organizations? Why are they doing it this way? Well, in part, you know, it's for the Iranians to buy some time. It's to buy some time, but also execute an amount of pressure on the American administration because they want to keep the United States in kind of a, uh, let's call it a de-escalatory position, despite escalations that even Iran is doing itself. Um, right. And that goes for Gaza. It's interesting because the administration uh, here uh, has been saying, well, no, you see, these are these are not interlinked conflicts that are going on. They're all interlinked. The Iranians want people to know that they're interlinked and they want to know yeah. that they push a button and they can you know, turn on networks in Yemen. They can turn on a bunch of networks in Iraq. They can turn on a bunch of networks in Syria or in Lebanon. They want people to know that that's kind of that that. Um, almost kind of imperial style of, you know, look what we can bring to the table. Um, so that's not something that's all that hidden. Um, but that's kind of what you're seeing in Iraq, where they're trying to put pressure to say, hey, well, if the Israelis are really successful in Gaza, well, we can press our button and you're going to have problems at this, you know, forward operating base in Syria, or you're going to have a problem at Al Assad Air Base. And it will be facing a number of kind of asymmetrically set up units. And who knows, maybe that turns into something else. Maybe that turns into us, I don't know, like in 2019, uh, holding massive protests that are all Shia militia organized in front of the U.S. embassy and threatening to overtake it. I mean, that's one of the reasons right. why um, uh, it's one of the reasons why Qasem Soleimani and Mohandas were killed uh, in 2020 because of this escalatory behavior that the Iranians were actually doing, whereas, you know, we weren't really responding all that much. Um, so there's a piece of it there and you'll notice how the piece of it there on that sub level of this Iraq, these Iraqi groups can do X, Y, and Z. They are right now trumpeting the fact that, Hey, we, the, the Islamic resistance in Iraq, whatever groups make up said network, um, we can reach out and touch someone and we can do it very effectively. Cause look, we launched an operation that, you know, hit into Israel. Um, we launched an operation that could hit, you know, allies that hit into Jordan. Uh, we nailed Syria. We hit this in Iraq. Um, you know, you should be more fearful of us because of the the possibilities we bring with us. Um, now, again, I, can we say that some of that is them, I, I guess, I, you know, put, 
the front groups putting on their own front. Um, you know, sometimes it is because you want to show off, you have different skills and you can pull off different operations and you're looking for outsized effect. Um, but is it, it is a somewhat effective way for them to kind of send that message in that area. It also will help in crafting the United States to say, to say Israel, let's say Israel's got a number of, of targets on their list, uh, that they could possibly hit that, you know, be you know, good for them in, in the long term. Well, then you have an American policymaker telling them, Hey, look, we don't want this to go too far, which again, who, which bill does that fit? It often fits what the Iranians want while still giving the Iranians enough space. I think the classic thing that we're seeing from all of this, uh, as I was saying before, was there is now an acceptance, which is, it, it's, I say it's hilarious in the darkest of senses, um, that we uh, in the West have now essentially accepted what the Iranians have been building for decades which I thought was quite present by 2013, um, which is that they have regional reach, that they can put pressure on uh, you know, two first world governments with, with highly effective and efficient armies and intelligence apparatuses, and actually get something out of it for doing you know, often very, very little, but still it's quite a bit when you really kind of boil it down. Um, and I think that's, it's, it's a massive sea change that, you know, I think a lot of policymakers in the United States and Europe are coming to the conclusion about, of course, that's extraordinarily late. Um, and you know, the yeah. thing is you're, you're giving Iran a lot of, a lot of uh, credit with that. Cause often I think the Iranians uh, have their own kind of, uh, uh, smoke and mirrors that come to a lot of this where often they are not really able to you know, project all that much, but they'll do the best that they can. So you think that they can, uh, so sometimes you get you know, representations of that as well. Um, and I guess that that brings me back to Yemen. So now as we're going to Yemen, you have a group there named Ansar Allah, uh, or the Houthis. Um, and the Houthis have been around since the 90s. Um, really, a, a lot of Iranian aid to them came through uh, starting in about 2005. That's like when I'm when I was able to really see it, see it. Um, but everything has come through to them. Now, imagine this is a group in Yemen, that has been fighting Saudi Arabia. It's fought the UAE. Uh, it has yeah. fought local uh, 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 Yemeni actors. Uh, so the 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 Saudis and the Emiratis have been sort of engaged um, against the Houthis in in as part of Yemen's brutal civil war since about 2015. Yes, and a lot of the air campaign that was launched against Yemen. This was by Saudi Arabia. Uh, so there's a lot of talk about that. Um, even Bahrain had some special units that were there that were assisting with it. Right. Um, so you had essentially, you know, a good chunk of the Gulf Co Cooperation Council that was just operating in, in Yemen, just to use kind of a name that people might recognize. Um, so you had that there, but this, the Iranians, you know, imagine this, the Houthis themselves are not even the same type of Shia as uh, the Shia in Iraq. Or the Shia in Lebanon. Those are twelve, what they call twelve or Shia. Um, and there's, think of it this way. I'll boil it down. They have a different way of viewing Shiism, viewing Islam, than say the Houthis do, who are five or Shia, uh, Zaydi Shia. Um, okay. So you have the five or Shia there, and there was like a lot of talk about this. Well, I mean, they're different Shia. I mean, how you know how could Iran work with them? And I mean, sometimes here's the interesting, like really interesting thing, that has played a part in how the Houthis deal with the Iranians. Um, it has played a part in terms of how they view themselves on a regional stage. Oh, no, no. We, we respect and like the Islamic revolution in Iran, but we could do it better. Sometimes you get you know, instances like this. Other times you see where uh, the Houthis will kind of, you know, they will not just kind of act autonomously, but they will also act almost in unison with what the Iranians are doing. Um, we saw this before when uh, the Yemen campaign was going on hardcore. We saw it with cooperation with Iraqi groups, uh, some cooperation with Lebanese Hezbollah, uh, reports that Houthis were actually fighting in Syria sometimes, although I've, you know, I, I've, I've, I've seen something that could qualify as, as kind of certifying that as, as actually happening. And then I kind of take a step back because I kind of go, mm, I, don't, I don't know if I can really trust the source here. Um, but anyway, I mean, you see action like this, and the Iranians have been very clever in terms of what they supply to the Houthis. And we're talking about every kind of small arms system known to man, uh, rockets, guidance systems, uh, drone systems, uh, you know, the training and advisory uh, 
kind of a type of personnel and equipment that's required uh, so that they can kind of get up to speed. Um, you see a lot of the promotion of the Houthis in Iranian media and also in their other proxies, a lot of promotion about how they are part of, you know, the grander kind of axis of the resistance, as they call it, and part of the, uh, you know, the Islamic resistance networks that uh, Iran operates. Um, and so, you know, I, I think for a lot of people who are, you know, Yemen watchers, Houthi watchers, they're thinking, well, you know, are they popping these off to show that they, you know, they, I mean, imagine, take another step back here. On the Houthi flag, it says death to America, death to Israel, curses unto the Jews, uh, and victory for Islam. That's, that's okay. on, on the official flag. Um, so it's interesting. Well, are they trying to play to that 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 uh, kind of narrative by doing this? I mean, are they doing it? I mean, Because I've heard this. I've heard this from other people. Maybe they're, they're doing it a little bit more excessively on their own to demonstrate that they can they themselves can reach out and touch someone. Um, but I, I find that a bit questionable. I, I, I actually don't really buy into that at all, because it's really intriguing how the Iranian propaganda network will start turning its wheel, start turning its wheels. Um, the minute something happens, and it's almost like there is, it's kind of going in tandem with a lot of other statements. So for instance, you, uh, you brought up some of the actions in the Red Sea uh, mm -hmm. that were occurring, including the one recently. Um, so what was going on in the Red Sea, you had uh, essentially an act of, of, of piracy on the high seas by the Houthis who took over, you know, a ship. Um, and then after that, you're getting other missile attacks and things like that. Now that might seem like, oh, okay, well, they're on the Red Sea and they want to demonstrate that they can shut down a major shipping lane. That makes total sense. Um, and if you notice this, there's also a piece there where they've tried to target, you know, quote unquote, Israeli owned ships. They're not always Israeli owned. Sometimes there's this assumption that they are, but Hey, who cares? We got a ship. Um, and it's interesting because it traces back to a Said Hassan Nasrallah speech, Said Hassan Nasrallah being... Uh, yeah. The secretary general of Lebanese Hezbollah, who said in his speech, well, more economic pressure needs to be put on the Israelis, full well knowing that the Israelis have mobilized a huge chunk of their population, uh, their reserves, that, uh, you know, speaking in terms of, of kind of their economy, that that's going to put a lot of pressure. I mean, he was saying that, uh, you know, Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan, where uh, Israel gets a lot of its, its uh, oil, gas, that kind of thing. Uh, that they should shut down shipments there. And now all of a sudden the Houthis who have you know, regularly lauded Nasrallah, um, now they're trying to shut down major shipping in the Red Sea. Now, again, taking us back a few a few years back to the 1960s, um, when, the, when the Straits of Tehran were, were, when like the Egyptians tried to shut them down, when the Red Sea was shut down to Israeli shipping, um, that was a cause for the 1967 war. That was a cause for the Six Day War. So it's not as if they don't know the fire that they're kind of playing with here, but they want to send the signal that if they wanted to, they could, and they will put pressure on them uh, using using those avenues of pressure. Um, so I think you're you're seeing that that's it's there were kind of different strategic like mini strategic plays within the larger kind of goal of what the Iranians want, um, and then you have you know kind of smaller plays that are there as well. You know the 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 Houthis are able to demonstrate that after all all the war and all the fighting and everything else that was going on, uh, that they still pose a significant threat to the Saudis. They still pose a significant threat even to the Israelis. They're able to launch ballistic missiles at a lot. They're you know able to do you know what they want vis a vis the Americans sometimes. Um, it's a great way to stand up a proxy group by demonstrating that they have what might be viewed as by by some. Uh, as this kind of autonomous, you know, strong capability and, you know, look at the new weapon systems they're bringing to the fore and look at all the cool stuff that they can do. Um, so that's part of it. The other part of it is you can put pressure on the Israelis. Hey, you like having shipping going into a lot? We can, we're just going to keep sending guys out and we're going to see, keep sending missiles and we're going to keep attacking that kind of thing. Right. Which means we now have a pressure point when it comes to any other negotiation that you might have with Hamas. Um, so we've got that too. Um, same thing goes with the Iraqis, you know, the Iraqi pressure point is, uh, okay, well, you know, the Israelis are doing, you know, a, a, a lot of bombing and everything else in Gaza and they're really hurting, you know, Hamas and we need to kind of stand up for them. Well, okay, we'll put pressure on their greatest ally, the United States, and we can kind of remove some of that pressure there while simultaneously demonstrating that even the pinprick sort, sort of things that don't always get the attention that, you know, we want them to have. Um, they still had outsized effect. So you're seeing a lot of that right now with a lot of these proxy attacks that are being launched against the U.S., the Israelis, uh, and other actors in the region. 
Thanks for that. So there's been, I guess, since October 7th, there's been kind of endless debate about the extent to which the Iranians um, knew of Hamas's planning for the attack or or exercised some kind of operational or strategic control over it. Do you kind of see the same degree of Iranian control over these attacks elsewhere in the region? Like, are they, I guess, are are, are, are these groups taking direct orders from the home office back in Tehran to like seize this ship. Okay, today go fire another missile at this airbase or are they all kind of trying to I guess have their mar- their broader marching orders, you know, like 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 responding to Hassan Nasrallah's speech. They have their broader marching orders and they're all sort of trying to please their masters in Tehran and take a bite at the apple as part of this broader conflict. I guess so how do you how do you see that how how coordinated is this with the iraqis that's i would i would make the argument uh this current kind of operational setup that they have is 100 percent being run by the iranians 100 mm-hmm. percent. i think there's a little bit more question to the houthis but you know it's the difference between 75 percent and 100 percent. right you know it's just it's still out there kind of pink and naked we kind of know who's running what and it's interesting what they're launching at that sort of time and also the weapon systems that they are advertising that they're using and then the praise that they're getting you know if the iranians don't like something they don't tend to give it all that much praise and sometimes again i will say sometimes they do to kind of still claim that the bona fides of uh you know oh no no we're actually running things and we're tough and we can be tough you know there's no problem there right um but you can kind of notice it and and it's again it's a certain je ne sais quoi uh that's that's there um, it is very hard to explain, but you can kind of see when, you know, maybe a group is not really listening and it's kind of got its own issues. Um, you can also sometimes see it if, you know, they're playing games on on that end. Um, but, you know, sometimes I think the Iranians like it in that gray zone. They want us to see gray zone. Well, how much control do they really have? Well, I, how can I retaliate against the Iranians themselves if they don't even really have control over this group? They have played that game for decades. They played it with Lebanese Hezbollah. They played it with a lot of the Iraqi groups. And it doesn't mean to say that they don't have issues with these groups. Again, it's not black or white. Um, There's many, many uh, kind of tones of gray that are there. Um, But that does not necessitate that the Iranians are not calling the shots. Now, again, you get a dual fold of this, too. I mean, we're we're bifurcating here where um, the Iranians benefit from both ends. Either they don't have control, the, the, the... the kind of assumption they don't have control means, oh, well, you know, we can't we can't put pressure on the Iranians now because these guys are just running their mouths off and doing their thing. Um, the other side of it is it's the Iranians. You know, once you do say they have control, ah, look at this wide network they control. We should give them some respect. Either way, they they have used this to kind of come out on top to kind of push what they want. Um, I am more on the side of saying that despite either you know internal issues at times, um, the bigger thing here is the Iranians are really running this, this show. Um, I think it's interesting. I think a lot of analysts were caught by surprise, uh, by kind of how hardcore the Houthis went into this. Yeah. And again, I actually, I, I, the more I'm looking at it, it actually makes a ton of sense, uh, from a variety of different pictures. One, they're shocked. So that must mean something. I don't think the Iranians are that stupid to know when they can kind of pull a rabbit out of their hats. Yeah. Uh, and they've done that before. Um, so, I mean, I see a part of it there. The other part of it is if I'm trying to send signals in the region and again, they're, they are hitting at two of my main foes, me being Iran, um, that's Saudi Arabia. That is the state of Israel. If I have this actor that can now demonstrate that they can hit the strongest military power uh, that is in the Middle East yeah. and they can do their own thing. Um, and they can also kind of really threaten different operations there. Nope, that sounds like a good it sounds like a good move on the chessboard. Um, so I, I'm I, I would not be. I mean, I, I even saw kind of the ramp up to this. So it was very similar to kind of the ramp up for Syria. Oh, are they actually you know ramp up to Syria in, in like 2012, 2013? Oh, are, are you know these groups kind of operating independently? They're just getting volunteers who are going to Syria. Well, in some cases they are getting volunteers. However, they're being commanded by you know IRGC controlled. Iraqi units. Um, but there are certain little hints that were there that would say to me, you know, we should have known the Houthis were going to do something. I just think the 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 
I guess the working assumption was that the Houthis would do something maybe smaller, um, maybe something not as kind of grandiose as one hijacking a ship uh, or popping off a number of ballistic. I mean, the first, essentially the first space battle was fought between the Houthis and Israel. Yeah, the Arrow 3. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's quite something. That's the, that is a, a history book <laughs> that makes the history books. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I kind of look at that and I'm going, okay, you know, that's, it's an interesting way to show capability. It's an interesting way to show reach in the region. It's another interesting way for the Iranians to say, you know, give us some respect and, and, you know, we deserve X, Y, Z. Yeah. The, um, the, you make a good point about the arrow three, um, intercept. I sort of made it a, a dumb joke on 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 twitter at the time i said there's some dudes at space command sort of crying in their beer right now like but my x-37b um you know like that's like the first like yeah space battle um that we yeah. get is through this through this militia so i mean you you make a, a good point about bringing up i guess um the houthis uh activities over the past month or so i mean and you said earlier about how the iranians like to at certain sort of strategic moments unveil um allow their proxies to unveil new kind of special weapon systems or abilities you know so the houthis launched numerous cruise missiles they yesterday fired missiles at a u.s warship that takes some serious balls when they seized the galaxy leader they fast roped from a helicopter down onto the deck i mean that's not stuff that you would associate with their common conception of them as just sort of like ragtag pirate militia. Do you think that the Houthis are sort of using this moment as a sort of an excuse to kind of establish themselves as a serious player in the region within Iran's war chest on par with one of the more major Iraqi groups or Lebanese Hezbollah? Yes, but I mean, I think they had within the Iranian circle, they had already kind of achieved that kind of of, of, of setting, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think it's the utilization of them this time around that has given kind of the Iranians a different, a different piece here. Um, I mean, again, I think the fact that we were seeing, uh, you know, the Houthis are being lauded by, you know, IRGC, uh, to say, Hey, you know, no, these are part of the axis of resistance. I have, again, I have my own little doubts that, the, that everything was completely hunky dory that, you know, some of the representations there were, I see that you know we're putting counter pressure internally yeah. uh, to to do certain things. At the end of the day, though, what other allies do the Houthis have? You know, what other support networks do they really have? Um, and it's interesting, given Yemen is still a, a bombed out hulk of of what it was, uh, that the Houthis have you know continued to invest in their military affairs. Um, and you know, hey, we're you know what we're going to do? We're going to help liberate the Palestinians now. You realize that Sana is not <laughs> the, yeah. the city itself needs to function now that you rule it. Yes. Um, so, I, I mean, I think there is there are two pieces to this. You have the Houthis, which are demonstrating their own capability, their own reach, that they're sticking by their messages, that they can you know reach out and touch someone. And it's the Iranians, too, who get to play that dual game that I was saying before. I mean, it's it, it's 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 kind of the magical, like when you boil it down, you're going like, well, is there a piece that you know, you can counter them on where they've kind of been screwed over. Well, it's almost like they've built these networks so that they, you know, don't don't have these issues so that you are running into the wall and saying, well, I mean, if they don't run them, then it's this. If they do run them, then it's this. Um, and I, I think the way the Iranians tend to run things with the Houthis, um, you know, they and this also goes with a lot of other groups. And I, I brought this up before. You know, if a group isn't fully listening, then they create splinters or they create internal feuds or they, they exploit different issues that are going on within them. Uh, they also make a demonstration that, hey, you know, you need the money, you need the guns, you need all this fun stuff from us. And the minute we pull that away, good luck. So I, I'm, I'll get into a good one for you. Um, this actually happened to both Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which is far more, you know, yeah. quote unquote, directly controlled. Yeah by Iran. But when, and I'll, this is like a classic example, and I, I have a, a piece that's coming out uh, uh, later um, for uh, CTC Sentinel, and I talk about this in there. Um, but in 2015, uh, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which has somewhat close ideological links to the Iranians, it's been a very close proxy to the Iranians for quite a while. Um, they had their funding pulled. Well, why they have their funding pulled to kind of tack on to the Houthi issue because they didn't offer public praise of the Houthis 
and of the Houthi attacks against the Saudis. Because remember, Gaza is mostly Sunni, uh, Sunni Muslim. Um, and, you know, this was kind of a Shia war against a large Sunni power, which is Saudi Arabia. Um, and they were not coming out and doing that. So the Iranians just said, OK, we're going to close the spigot now and uh, good luck with the funding. And we're going to pour all of our money into a group that we have splintered from you, PIJ. Um, and we are going to do that. Oh, by the way, the group is also Shia, you know, from all six Shia that are in Gaza. Um, and they're getting, you know, millions of dollars and you know, all this stuff. So what I'm getting at is. You know, the Iranians, it's not all just kind of fun and games. Oh, God, you know, we're brothers in the Islamic resistance. Bear hug, you know, <laughs> yeah. let's get together. Rah, rah, rah. Um, there is kind of a, a, a push and pull with them at times to maintain that control. And it would not shock me that, you know, possibly something with the Houthis was done in that way. Um, I mean, I'm sure it was. Um, and, you know, the Houthis are here now, you know, executing attacks that fit with kind of the Iranian bill of what they want strategically so that, you know, the pieces move accordingly. Yeah. Um, it's just it said at the, at the top of the show that, I mean, so far there's been, um, 68 U S service members wounded thus far, knock on wood, no KIAs. Do you think that's not for lack of trying or are the, or are these groups and vis-a-vis -vis the Iranians trying to keep the violence below a certain threshold? Uh, you know, I have a few answers to this. Um, they are launching weapon systems, like certain UAVs, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, mm -hmm. that have proven their effectiveness in places like Ukraine. Uh, they've proven their effectiveness in, in Iraq. Um, they've proven it in Yemen. Um, and I'm, I'm I look at that when kind of that's what's being utilized. It's the, oh, we can bring this this piece to the table and hit something. Well, they're clearly targeting you know, American sites yeah. that could have American personnel who could get killed. Um, do I think that there's some calibration in terms of the calculation that they want? I do. I do. I'd make the argument that they do uh, because they would you know release certain weapon systems to be used uh, accordingly uh, with other front groups. No, 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 you guys can use the Katushas here. Mm -hmm. No, you guys can use this rocket system. We're going to unveil it now to send this signal. Um, don't get me wrong. I think any of these groups privately would be very happy if they killed an American. Um, but I think in large part, you know, they also have to worry about, you know, what is the American response going to be? And so, you know, they're dealing with, I mean, the administration right now is acting quite, let's call it tactically. Right. Um, and trying to send the signal of, of very, very slow, deliberate, non-escalatory behavior. And what you saw was, I mean, I imagine during the Trump administration, uh, he had the, the famous statement of, you know, if uh, one drop of American blood is spilled, then we're going to take, you know, 10 gallons from you. It was something along those lines. Right. Um, and then executed it with Soleimani and Mohandas and, you know, 25 Qatab Hezbollah and Qatab Sayyid al-Shuhada guys getting uh, killed out in eastern Syria. Um, that sent a signal to the Iranians, oh, okay, well, I, we have to act in an escalatory fashion to demonstrate that we have power and that we're not, you know, a bunch of bozos. Um, but at the same time, if we do that, we don't want to lose the entire command structure for Iraq. Uh, you know, that might not be a good outcome. Right. Um, so I think what they're doing is they're trying to read the tea leaves of the Americans. And with the Americans, you know, we were essentially hitting many of these times the kind of the, the empty warehouse. I wrote an article back in, in 2021. I actually praised the Biden administration for, which was quite different from the Obama administration, which didn't really hit back at all against the Iranians. They were very, very eager to have the Iran deal. Um, and from what I had, I had seen from a lot of the, the militia groups, you know, you kind of have to send the signal sometimes. That would be you know, good policy advice. And um, and so then, I mean, I, th I, I praised Biden for hitting some warehouses that were out in Eastern Syria. And I remember I got a fusillade of criticism in my, my direct messages, uh, from, you know, other area people who, you know, while never really publicly saying it themselves, because, <laughs> Hey, we, you know, we can only say so much. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was interesting because it's like, yeah, they hit an empty gas station. Like, what do you want? And so I was thinking, okay, well, maybe this can, maybe this serves as something else. Well, I learned um, you know, we are kind of following through on, on hitting the empty gas station tactic. Uh, you know, that's the, the empty gas station strategy, if you will. Um, and that was going on for quite a while. And, and when I say that it's only elevated in kind of a tactical sense, you'll notice what we hit with the AC-130 when uh, we killed a Qatar Hezbollah member. 
Um, and that was probably either a rocket or a UAV team that was going out to, you know, an area near Ayn al-Assad. We probably got the intercepts to demonstrate, hey, we're reading your mail. You know, please don't don't mess around. You're going to find out. Um, so th- there's a piece of that that's there that was sent. And then afterwards, given there was still, you know, movement by these Shia militias through their front groups, then what did we do? We attacked a, a major Qatab Hezbollah uh, site. And I think, you know, eight of them. Uh, eight Qatab Hezbollah members were were killed. Um, but again, those are tactical moves. Now, a, a grander strategic move by the U.S. would be, okay, Akram Kabi, two leaders from Qatab Hezbollah, uh, maybe Abu Allah from Qatab Said al-Shuhada, you know, okay, you know what? You've hit too many American facilities and boop, 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 you know, this, this goes. That would be kind of the, the, I guess, during the Trump administration, that would be a demonstration of, okay, you, you want to play games. Um, and I mean, there are arguments for you know what that sends, but I think because the administration is in a more de-escalatory mood and they want to kind of uh, disconnect, you know, the links to Iran being able to do this and hey, we, we're going to just you know ceasefire and then this will work and then let's not put pressure here. Um, I think it makes it easier for them. And again, I'm not saying this in a mocking tone. I'm sorry, I'm just changing the tone yeah, to yeah. make better sense. Um, but part of this is it's. The U.S. is really trying to kind of keep uh, keep this kind of dampened in a way to not have further involvement. Now, remember, we have two carrier strike groups in the area. Um, and I mean, this is after the administration had pulled out of Afghanistan, not the most popular move, given how it was executed. No. Um, and, you know, you have to keep that in mind. And the American populace, I don't think, is in the mood for another Middle East war or, you know, another thing that's going to happen that meanwhile, like, nobody can find, find you know, Gaza or Tel Aviv on a map. Um, so that creates a bit of an issue. Um, so, I mean, you're, you're dealing with that on, on a domestic front and you're having responses that are kind of according to that. You know, it's it's OK, well, this is how we can do it. This is how we can micromanage it. And we'll just keep it in a tactical in a tactical mindset. Um, so I think the Iranians are kind of basing that to go back to your question. You know, are they trying to kill Americans? If they really wanted to, now we could even ask this question after Qasem Soleimani was killed. Yeah. After he was killed, the Iranians launched ballistic missiles at American facilities, and you know they created some some uh, issues where people were having oh, yeah, brain trauma and some other stuff, but uh, no one was killed from that. Um, I think that's mere happenstance. They would have been perfect, perfectly happy if somebody did get killed. But I also think it's predicated on, well, you know, I think the Americans can accept two or three casualties right. uh, and we won't get you know, bitten as hard. Um, but, you know, we still need to send a message. So I think you have that kind of that that calibration, if you can call it that. Yeah, uh, that's going on with the Iranians. Um, but again, I, I, I don't want people to think that that excludes you, that it kind of excludes a position from saying, well, you know, Sometimes you need to hit them harder. I do believe that sometimes that's required. I do believe that sometimes it's better to maintain a tactical approach. But, it, you know, it's neither here nor there. Now, sometimes it works for this and sometimes it works for that. Um, but I think the Iranians in general, um, what they're sort of doing, I mean, I would actually say they have been operating in kind of a very, very low grade escalatory kind of move since Gaza. Uh, You had brought up before, you know, did they, you know, give a green light and how are we looking at this? Um, I think they were met with catastrophic success uh, because they must have expected that the Israelis would act in a certain way. And it's kind of interesting that, you know, um, a lot of, a lot of wars in the Middle East are because of misreads, uh, because of miscalculations. And the Iranians are quite famous for this too, because, you know, look at 2006 with Hezbollah, um, Said Hassan Nasrallah uh, himself yeah. even said this in 2006. Hey, you know, um, had I had I known that that this would have gone this way, you know, he intervened in part to take pressure off of Gaza. Keep that in mind. Um, and then in another part, you know, they were trying to launch different raids and kind of cause different issues on the northern border with Israel. Uh, and then this one succeeded, and it turned into a highly destructive war. Um, so anyway, you know, going off of that. For him, he said it openly, you know, even though it's the Wadl Sadiq, you know, the, you know, the, the, uh, the sacred promise, the, the, uh, the truthful promise, if you will. Yeah. Um, even though he said that, um, there was still kind of that moment of, oh, oh, we were not, we were not expecting these F-15s to pound just about everything down here. And, you know, there is the possibility of that. And again, I think you're seeing that from the American side. 
you're seeing it from the Israeli side. You're also seeing it from the Iranian proxy side and from the Iranians themselves. You know, it's the, well, okay, if we do this, you know, what's going to be the response? Um, so I think that's kind of how they're, they're looking at this position. So think Tankistan in DC, the Massachusetts Avenue crowd likes to use this they like to talk about reestablishing deterrence, right? Like sort of mm -hmm. the goal of Israel's operations in Gaza at the end of the day should be about reestablishing deterrence, right? Yeah. And so I guess looking at these attacks elsewhere in the region against U.S. forces, um, I believe it was timed with our first strike against them. Lloyd Austin put out a statement saying that these are these moves are specifically in retaliation to these specific attacks we have no desire to escalate this further unless you keep doing stuff, right? And the administration, I think, rightfully took a lot of criticism in, in the beginning that there were several attacks against us before the administration responded. We've yes. now responded several times. The attacks still keep coming, even though they're somewhat calibrated and kept at a certain kind of low-grade burn, mm -hmm. right? So I guess my question then is, if you were called up by Jake Sullivan and said, you know, come on down to the situation room, and he asked you, how do we reestablish deterrence with these groups? How do we speak a language that they'll understand and get them to sort of back off a bit? What would you say? Uh, it would take a, that would take a lot. <laughs> um, that would take a lot. I, because there, there's already the notion of kind of accepting, as I mentioned before, one of the greatest wins for the Iranians. Ignore Gaza. Ignore ignore it all. One of the greatest wins for them, even with catastrophic success, is the ability to establish that they now have different red lines mm -hmm. and that they can bring something to the table that, oh, well, you know, we're going to need to de-escalate in Syria and Iraq to make, and we're going to have to affect the Israelis in that way. Um, you know, we're going to have to kind of get them to turn, you know, turn the engine off. Um, you know, after they're responding to, you know, rapes, murders, you know, 1,200 killed. Um, I, I think that's a sea change. And the acceptance of that, and if you remember back to, you know, generally, generally the Obama policy and the Iran deal kind of style of policy, which was including Iran into security decisions and kind of allowing them some breathing room, if you will, uh, to do their thing. Um, I mean, I think that's when the kind of cat was out of the bag. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, again, this is, <laughs> let's reverse a couple of decades. Um, but it, it's, you know, it, it, it's hard in that way. Um, what I would say is, I mean, I, again, I am one who would say, um, there, I'm sure there are plenty of policymakers out there who would, who would make the argument, well, you know, they're just small scale attacks and clearly they're not really aimed at killing anyone. It's just so that they can look strong. Um, now the, the more militant side of me would say, okay, so I'm not allowing that either because the minute you let one through, then, you know, right. you're, you're sending a poor signal, you know, you're supposed to be, you know, the Shaitan al-Akbar, the great Satan here, you know, and, uh, why don't you demonstrate, you know, some of that prowess in terms of, you know, reaching out and touching someone, um, you know, why, why are we kind of being this flexible? Um, but the other side of me would also say, hey, um, we kind of need to be flexible and we need to see where their escalation goes. Though I would make the argument that the retaliation has been far too tactical mm -hmm. uh, and not kind of thinking in terms of, you know, it, the minute this stuff started to really escalate, I'm talking new weapon systems, we're talking drones, we're talking larger rockets, the announcement of larger rockets going to be used, then... You know, my answer to that would have been, okay, you want to play escalation dominance, you're going to lose a commander here. Yeah. Uh, and I, again, I don't mean to be flippant about talking about, you know, killing people. Um, but again, we're talking about escalation dominance. We're talking about a lot of deterrence kind of moves. But then you run into this, this other issue, which I think most Americans are really concerned with, which is, okay, where does that stop? Because it's not like the Iranians going to really turn off the spigot on some of this. Um, although I would still say, you know, if we look back to, let's, let's look at kind of another example. Um, the amount of escalation the Iranians were able to do after Qasem Soleimani and Abu Mahdi al uh, were killed wasn't really that big. I mean, I think it demonstrated they were a paper tiger. And I think sometimes we need to recognize when, you know, we don't need to play the role of paper tiger because it never suits us very well. Um, the Iranians actually are in many cases. Um, they run, yes, a lot of very dangerous, successful, and productive networks. However, 
uh, when you know how they operate, which is through these very closed, very tight networks, very you know strategically placed commanders, um, you can put a wrench in that wheel real fast um, when certain people are not there to kind of run the show. Um, so I, again, I mean, hitting you know hit, hitting a rocket team is one thing. That's one thing. Fine, that is a, a direct tactical thing. They are a threat to Americans. Okay, that's understandable. Um, but if you're trying to send a signal of, hey, um, we also know where all their orders are coming from, and it would probably be best for you not to do that. Right. Unveiling that medium range, you know, rocket. I don't really think that's going to show its, itself here. That's not what's going to happen. You know, I, so I mean, I think, again, um, if I if I were you know, doing that kind of advice, I mean, it's, it's kind of how I would roll through it, even though it sounds, you know, kind of lugubrious and, and, and annoying. Um, but I mean, I, I think those considerations really need to play into it. And, and I think with a lot of policy there, there are a lot of policymakers, I think, on, you know, there are a lot of people who work from a conclusion backwards in search of facts because they, you know, either, either you know, they want de-escalation because let's say, say they call themselves non-interventionists, you know, and then they'll say, well, but you know, really, we have to do this diplomatically cool because that's totally worked before, you know, or you get another side of let's kill Khamenei. <laughs> Oh, okay. It will. Yeah. Let's nuke Tehran. But it's, you know, but it, I mean, I, I'm noticing, I mean, I think social media has done this to a lot of people. And then you kind of have to think of, uh, you know, what are American interests? Number one, you know, I, I, it's almost like this is, I've said this some, for so many years, I feel like saying America's interest or American interests is a dirty word because, you know, okay, well, we want, you know, unobstructed oil flow out of there. We want general stability. We don't want, I would hope, um, you know, the rise of theocratic Iran, which can control a number of other countries using proxies and having their proxies run just roughshod over regional allies. We want regional allies, I guess, to adopt you know, certain democratic norms or at least, you know, quote unquote, Western norms, whatever. But if those are goals, you can't, you know, you can't just do it from, you know, behind a curtain and just go, well, OK, well, you know, we'll give you some money and, or maybe we won't. And maybe we'll just sit here now and you guys can solve that issue. Right. I, I mean, it, you get the same side, you know, you get the same same thing from from other sides, too. But I think that's happening a lot. I mean, I think you see it also. Uh, social media, I will blame for this because it's much easier to get out. Great hot take policy advice in 120 words. And then meanwhile, not even know about the actor that you're, you're talking about. Well, that doesn't matter. You know, whatever. Just yeah. Boil it down. But I, again, I, I still am of the belief that that a, a policy of direct action doesn't necessarily translate into, uh, well, now you're just expanding the war. You know, I can claim... I could very easily claim the Iranians have actively expanded this war, which they did, despite the fact that they were not, you know, not in the escalation that most people would say, oh, but that's what I wrote about. And that's what they should be doing. No, they did it in a different way. Now, there's no real criticism on that end of it, is there? It's the, and the Americans just, you know, putting this carrier strike battle group, you know, da, da, da. Um, I just find it interesting. The perspectives that people see it from, it's not really holistic. Um, and I think we run into that problem sometimes where, and we see it with how we, we execute foreign policy quite a bit. It doesn't really matter the administration, but you know, the, the, uh, the, f the foreign is always domestic in the United States. And I think because of that, there is this kind of warped view on really how to execute things without being kind of, uh, cold and decisive. So, you know, to, to sum it up and just say, well, you know, I, I think there were a lot more moves we could have done that from the outside, some would say, but didn't that escalate things? But when you look at the big, the broader picture, was that truly a huge escalation? Not really. It actually demonstrated, you know, uh, strong U.S. power going forward and countering a foe and keeping them, you know, uh, keeping them on their heels a bit so that they are not able to keep pushing. Because what the Iranians do is it's kind of this constant, you know, eating, 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 eating. It's like, like, you know, like a termite. Um, it's like a termite eating at a structure. Um, and, and again, they will look for outside effects to do it. You know, do they want to run these proxies in an election? Okay. <laughs> do they want to have social networks with people? Do they want to kill people that are opposing them? Yes. But they try to do this because they want to entrench themselves. And this even comes down to the armed policies that they, they utilize against the United States and against the Israelis, against any regional actor, the Saudis, the Bahrainis, whatever. Um, it's all part of that. And, you know, a lot of the other stuff is it's as my grandfather would have said, it's all just talcum powder. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, thanks for that. I, I yeah, I, I think we're sort of on the on the same page there. I, I've thought for a while that maybe I don't know one of these more popular militia commanders should be incinerated in his land cruiser, so the rest of them at least have to think twice about their mortality before ordering these attacks. Maybe. Well, you're seeing the Israelis already doing this. Yeah. So you know, there's the the possible, and again, the Israelis and, and Hezbollah have been doing this back and forth, uh, and the Israelis have been quite effective at hitting very interesting leadership structures and kind of demonstrating that they have the prowess to do so. So there was a report that, you know, the, the uh, Lebanese Hezbollah has, it's both a, a Syrian Shia and also Lebanese Shia uh, within Hezbollah. It's called, you know, the uh, Radwan. So the Radwan unit uh, is often marketed as elite. It pulled on a lot of other recruits that weren't so good back in the day, but it is quite an established unit. Um, and, you know, the report was saying, well, you know, there is a leader there and also a mid-level commander that was also in the house that the Israelis hit, yep. you know, and you're seeing that, you know, you want to send a signal. Okay. Hey, you like, you like extending the range of the rockets that are now hitting Haifa. Well, uh, we know the guy who's giving the order to push them off. And also the one that you need is the solid glue that's in there. Right. Um, but again, I mean, you'll, you'll notice this. I mean, again, this is the misread that you get in a lot of different policy circles, which is, well, now that you've done that. You know, what's the end result? They're still launching rockets. Well, in large response because they have to, but they're also not as effectively executing it. And also you've sent them the signal and also internally damaged the group. You've internally damaged the group because you don't have, let's say, a charismatic leader, or you don't have a guy who really knows the equipment very well, or you don't have a guy who you know works really well with senior commanders and also junior commanders. Um, it's interesting how a lot of times that's like never really calibrated in there. It's just kind of this baseline of, but they still launched a bunch of rockets. Cool. Did the rockets work? You know, it's just, yeah. you know, so anyway, I mean, I, again, that's the calculation going forward. And I think, you know, a lot of people, it, it, it's hard. It, it's hard when you're just viewing the news stream and you're going, well, oh, but then more rockets are fine. Why does the cycle of violence continue? Um, and I, I, I think it, it's, we in general need a more mature view on a lot of this stuff um that's you know and i'm not going to say everybody needs to be an expert on villages in south lebanon um but i mean I, I think thinking about second and third order and thinking about why certain policies are executed would be helpful to many people following the conflict in terms of kind of a colder not so hot-blooded analysis or not so kind of domestic politically focused one yeah. So I would, while you're here, I'd be remiss not to at least ask about Lebanese uh, Hezbollah. Um, on November 3rd, I believe it was, um, Hassan Nasrallah gave this landmark, widely anticipated speech um, in Beirut. Uh, he hadn't spoken that much publicly about the war in Gaza before. Um, a lot of observers were kind of worried that he might just outright declare war on on, on Israel and enter the conflict. Um, I mean, you and I know full well what these guys are capable of. And I think as bad as it is now in the region, it could still get orders of magnitude worse. Mm -hmm. Nisrallah essentially in his speech said, you know, Hamas, you guys are on your own. I wish you well. But, you know, we're kind of going to, you know, work our resistance through other means at the moment. I mean, maybe he's thinking of 2006 and what happened there. Um, just curious for, for, for your take on Nisrallah's speech and, and how you sort of see Hezbollah's role in the conflict here. I, I know this could be an episode all on its own, so maybe yeah, we try to keep it a bit more. Yeah. I'll keep, try to keep it truncated, but I think, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of assumptions that came out of the speech. And what I would say is the Iranians love to speak, the Iranians and their proxies. And Nasrallah is again, like the highest guy on the totem pole in terms of the proxy groups. Um, and, you know, I think Lebanese Hezbollah and a lot of the other proxy organizations that they want the eventual big showdown with the Israelis. Yeah. They talk about it. They talk about it in messianic terms. Again, you're dealing with messianic organizations. So yeah, you know, they tend to have rather apocalyptic visions of, uh, of what's going to happen to their foes and uh, how they're going to execute it. And don't worry, they're going to be the ones carrying the swords. Um, so, I mean, you, you have that, but you know, it, there's a calculation that's there as well. And I think for Lebanese Hezbollah, it was demonstrating, you know, the Israelis were kind of focused on, on really hitting uh, certain precision guided uh, munitions that were going to them, um, hitting certain commanders, command structures. Um, Lebanese Hezbollah is also very busy kind of micromanaging Syria in many cases, mm -hmm. uh, because they pretty much run, you know, they, they run Western Syria. 
um, at least in the areas that there are Shia militia presence or Iranian presence or you know Hezbollah presence. Um, so I, you have that. I, I, again, we could make the argument, okay, they're approaching this from a place of weakness and they really can't do X, Y, and Z, maybe stuff that Hamas wanted. Hamas was actively pushing for them to get you know more involved, quote unquote. Um, and, you know, maybe that was not the calculation. And you kind of saw signals of this kind of going through in a lot of the statements that were coming out from Iraqi Shia groups, you know, um, you know, whenever they start <laughs> throwing out the Sabrine, you know, kind of talking point, which is yeah. how they were the patient ones. And it's like, hmm, what are we pay- being patient for today? Um, but it's, it, I see that. But what Lebanese Hezbollah has done, because now they are in a catch-22. They're in a catch-22 where maybe they were expecting where, they, you know, they were essentially expecting that they could just do this low grade kind of harassment to demonstrate that the Northern front will support a Southern front. And then meanwhile, the Southern front has been so quote unquote successful that it's like, uh, uh, this calculation, oh God, um, what are we, what do we need to do now? Um, so I think with, with Hezbollah, they're trying to still demonstrate, you know, that, okay, we can reach out and touch someone. We can handle things. We want to limit the amount of damage the Israelis give to us. Uh, of course, we're going to use other regional proxies to do so because, you know, it distracts and draws attention away from that main proxy, that main jewel, you know, in the crown right. that we can't have completely smashed to hell. Um, so I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I I got the impression when it was happening, when when the first Nasrallah speech was coming, you know, a lot of analysts that were saying either it's going to be, you know, a, a nothing burger or it's going to be you know, a something, a big declaration. And where did you get the declaration of war? Yemen. Oh, you know, notice you're getting it from the Houthis. Right. Um, but you'll notice that two-step kind of move. Okay, well, now you're refocused on this problem set. You see what I'm getting at that? Like, it, it's interesting, but that's kind of how the regional network works. That's how the Iranians can kind of play one off of the other and then kind of use it in this tactical or strategic manner. Um, and I think for Lebanese Hezbollah, you know, because they have a lot of, you know, their hands are tied in many different areas and they can only deploy so much. They can only do so much. Um, I frankly, I, I think the excuse that people were saying that, well, you know, they're tied up because the Lebanese economy is so bad. And they don't care. Yeah, no, they, they don't care. I don't, I don't buy that one bit. No, I don't buy that one bit because in 2008, oh, P.S., yeah, the economy wasn't as bad, but they had their telecommunications network threatened internally in Lebanon by Lebanese, or the Lebanese government. And so what did they do? You know what? We're going to take over Beirut. Have a nice day. Um, you know, had a very bloody, like mini civil war. Um, so I, I, I don't buy that answer. I'm not saying they don't calculate on it because I, I did work for a University of Maryland's Laboratory of Computational Cultural Dynamics. Say that fast. Say that three times fast. Um, <laughs> sounds like I have marbles in my mouth. But they did a study where it demonstrated that Lebanese Hezbollah will actually operate and, and kind of have further conflict when they're already kind of electorally satisfied. Like they can, they still have that chunk of the, the, the political pie. I'm not saying that they're not calculating in that way. However, um, what I'm trying to get at is I think some people are trying to add their, theolo- their, their, uh, uh, what's it called? Their, um, their theory texts that you would get in a master's program and then just apply it to a group that actually utilizes a very different way of thinking at times. That's how it you know, is again, sometimes. Again, conclusion backwards. <laughs> yeah, no, but it, it's conclusion backwards. Yeah. So, well, how is it working in reality? Yeah, but why isn't it working in theory? You know, it's, <laughs> it's that kind of thing. Um, but I, I mean, I, I think what we're seeing from them is you'll notice they're still acting. They are still doing things. So they're still able to put some level of pressure. I mean, their answer for their activities has been, well, look at how many reserve forces we've taken away from Gaza because they have to look after a northern border. You know, you have that line that's there. You also have a line that's there that, oh, well, you know, the minute pressure is being put on Hamas, well, or, or the, you know, the, the, the resistance in Gaza, uh, well, we're there to kind of do certain things. And it's really the Israelis who are overreacting. That's another one of these responses. Um, so I think, you know, Lebanese Hezbollah's position in all of this, um, it's one of kind of dancing on a tightrope. And I think they're, they're still being escalatory. I don't want people to think that, oh, well, you know, because they're in a weak position, they're not able to do certain things. They still have to demonstrate prowess. They still have to demonstrate power. They still have to demonstrate that they can do certain things because what they were doing so far, I mean, if you're just kind of a common observer of it, you're like, well, wait a sec, don't these guys have like hundreds of thousands of rockets pointed at the Israelis? And I, 
why aren't they doing this now? Mm-hmm. Don't don't they understand that Gaza is going to be you know rolled into by the IDF? Uh, yeah. um, and what you know Hezbollah has been doing, it's been nailing you know certain uh, uh, you know antennas and other kind of monitoring equipment on the border. Is that threatening in a way? Absolutely. Does that send a certain signal? Absolutely. However, is it you know you know killing twenty IDF soldiers that are on the border one day? No, no. And I think, you know, they have to kind of look at this, like how, how can we sell this? And I think that's really what they're running into. That's one of their, one of their issues. Yeah. Thanks for that. Anything else you wanted to uh, touch on today that we haven't yet? Oh, where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? I, 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 I'll say enough about, I, I've said, I think I said enough about Yemen, mm-hmm. um, but I do want to go back to Iraq and kind of some of the other interesting pieces that are there uh, and the way a lot of these networks really function. Um, and it, it's interesting, uh, with the Iranians, because they've had issues before with different groups, remember they have crafted upwards of 50 different organizations that they had influence over that were Shia militias. They were deploying tens of thousands of fighters, Shia Iraqis, in addition to, you know, Shia Afghans and Shia Pakistanis and Lebanese Shia, um, through a variety of different proxy groups. Uh, but with the Iraqis, it's kind of an interesting makeup. And recently, uh, the, uh, Kaisal Khazali, uh, who's the head of Asai Bahl al Haq? Um, he he did a recent interview, and actually, I put up a chunk of it from uh, you know on uh, on Twitter on my Twitter account or X account, whatever it's called today, um, where he actually was saying, you know, it's interesting when the Americans want to hit something, they're not targeting where the Iranians are, they're not killing Iranians, they're killing Iraqis, and Iraqi blood is very cheap. And he had kind of this this interesting signal about him. Now, again, we could say this is a piece to what I res- what I was saying earlier, where, oh, so he, is he playing that kind of a nationalist kind of card so that he can get a little bit more, you know, credibility in the elections and demonstrate that he's, you know, autonomous and has his own thing? Uh, maybe. Um, but I, I think there's another piece to this, too. Um, I, I think, you know, as we're kind of looking at this setup, the Iraqi Shia groups have not really backed down from the aggression and, and kind of the nasty statements and, and the kind of the, the broader action required against the Americans. I don't think that's an action that is their own kind of autonomous thing. Like they're not just doing that for the sake of it because, you know, we need to pop off some rockets and pop off some mortars and kind of go crazy. Um, I do think that's another pressure point that's being used by the Iranians as certain ceasefires come into, come into play, you know, with, with, uh, releasing certain Israeli hostages, and then uh, certain Palestinian prisoners are being released. But I think the way that they're using the Iraqis right now is that little kind of, it's a pawn in the greater chess game, but it's that pawn that allows them to kind of say, oh, well, you know, if we keep things along this straight and narrow, then, you know, I think it'll be okay, and we won't get another rocket or a UAV launched at us. And it, it's very interesting how they're using that element while simultaneously actively util- utilizing the Yemenis uh, with the Houthis. Um, and kind of how that's kind of working in tandem. Um, and I, I, I think more focus really needs to be shown, it needs to be looked at. I mean, again, it's, I think in the American setup and the American mindset, and I, I've complained about this and stuff that I've written, that we tend to look at things in like kind of the country. So, oh, well, I, I, I run the Yemen desk. Yeah, yeah, we have some crossover with Iraq. Yeah, we have some crossover here, but we really need to run Yemen. And that's kind of how it is in a nation state format. Right. And I really think What's coming to fruition was something that we had really seen hardcore in Syria, where uh, the kind of transnational networking, the kind of transnational strategy that Iran brings to the fore uh, is really demonstrating itself. And I would say from, you know, kind of American policymaker perspective, um, I think that that actually requires, if we were to actually handle anything in the Middle East, it's going to require people who are kind of specifically focused you know, dealing with that problem set, but also who have the expertise in Yemen or the expertise in Bahrain or the expertise in Iraq. But I think what's ending up happening is we are falling back into kind of the old picture of, yes, but that is an Iraq thing. And no, 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 this is a Yemen thing. And when it's as clear as day that this is a kind of regional network sort of thing, and it really requires people who are a little bit more skilled at watching that to kind of boil down where kind of the little nuanced details that matter are um, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just see from kind of statements that come out of the administration right now from the Biden administration that I, I guess maybe that's not the best way forward for them. Uh, and it seems, it strikes me as kind of, uh, a bit ludicrous in a way, mm-hmm. because I thought that we had, we had learned a bit better from prior examples. And, uh, 
you know, anyway, j- just to kind of say that it's, it's, I, I would say you got to watch a lot of these statements. You have to watch a lot of their actual actions uh, and what is actually going on because um, I, I just, I, I mean, I get the impression that we are so gung ho in terms of just maintaining that. No, this is all separate. No, this has nothing to, this has nothing to do with Gaza. No, no, this has nothing to do. Don't, don't worry about that. Don't worry about this, that we're actually falling into a larger kind of narrative trap in the future for when there actually is a much larger conflagration that may happen in the Middle East with Iranian backed groups, when we will only be equipped to deal with it in kind of this piecemeal fashion. But at that point, we're now going to be dealing with something that is far more cohesively organized. And it's quite cohesively organized right now. Well, thanks for that. Yeah, I mean, thanks. Thanks so much for coming back on. I think um, as this develops, you know, you are always welcome here. Um, I think listeners find the depth and nuance that you bring to your analysis just as useful as I have for years. So yeah, thanks for that. That's very kind. I mean, this is why, you know, they don't let me out very much. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Where can listeners find more about you and your work? Quite literally, just type in my name, Philip with two L's, S M Y T H. Yes, it's Smythe. <laughs> but um, but beyond that, I mean, yeah. I'm on Twitter uh, at Philip Smythe. Um, I've got my bio on the Washington Institute website, which actually has a lot of stuff that I've written um, on Jihadology. I did uh, a page from 2013 to around 2016. Uh, it was called Hezbollah Cavalcade. So when I was mentioning, oh, I wrote some of the, the first stuff in English about XYZ group. Um, it's often on there. Um but I, I tend to put things up and I, I, I publish in a lot of different places um, and I've been you know, quoted in a lot of different places. So you can just look it up and you can kind of see the general schema of what I'm thinking. I also try to respond to people uh, as long as they're being polite and they're not being crazy on Twitter, because then at times like I'm kind of just want to lace into them and knife hand them. Uh, but then I realize it's Twitter, so it's not going <laughs> to help. But I mean, I, I'm open to, to having questions asked. There was actually a listener uh, to this last time who sent me a very polite, really, really kind message to yeah. this, to this show. Um, but he sent me a very oh, kind cool. message, um, you know, and we were having a wonderful discussion on, on reading material kind of, okay, this is a good book on an introduction, uh, introduction to kind of Shiism and like what the belief structure is there and how Iran works. Um, I tend to appreciate those. And I promise you, I will respond with paragraphs of stuff if you want it. Um, <sighs> Yeah, yeah you just, will. You know, <laughs> I, I, I try to be open and helpful to people because I do, I am firm in the belief uh, that, uh, you know, if you're in a position where you have a lot of knowledge on that subject, you should try to help other people understand it if they're interested. And I try to kind of promote that sort of passion. And this listener wasn't my mom. No, was not, was not your mother. But if it was, wow, it, okay. if it were your mother, I can promise you she'd get at least five paragraphs on whatever, whatever subgroup, whatever subnetwork she wants within a Saibach al Hawk. Yeah. All right. Good to know. Well, mom, uh, when you hear this, I got all the contact details. Uh, you uh, let me know and we'll hook you up. This is what I'm here for. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, Philip Smythe, um, thanks for coming on, buddy. Uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Thanks so much, Matt. You're the best. Bye bye. for listening. This is Secrets and Spies.